the agenda with God, Anika Gray. Anika came to understand the things of the Spirit in 1998. Her passion is to see the captives free in the kingdom of God. And her calling is to worship people into his presence through worship, dreams, visions, and other prophetic ministry. Anika is also the founder of the Aralia School of Prophetic Dance, where she equips children and, and adults in understanding the prophetic ways of God. Shall we please, with an applause, welcome Anika Gray. Good afternoon, and God bless you all. Shall we lift up the name of Jesus? God is absolutely amazing. I stand here today before you just with a real grateful heart and a real appreciation for the journey that God has taken me on and to where he has brought me to today. So today what I'd like to share with you is a bit about my journey into purpose which started a very long time ago. Um, prophetess Jacqueline Annie spoke about the seven pillars that we could be called into, and some of us are called into multiple pillars. So today I'm gonna to speak about the creative pillar of dance that God called me into from a very young child and what that journey looked like. And hopefully you'll be able to just pick out some nuggets out of my my journey out of my story and hopefully it will build you and encourage you along your way okay so my journey goes all the way back to when i was a very small child um i could have been about three or four years old and it became very obvious to my parents and those around me that this child was going to dance this child was born to dance it's all i would do I would dance in front of the TV if we had um, guests around. After a meal, my mum would put me to dance. She'd open up the, you know, a, a, a platform for me to perform. And I was always willing and ready just to show off my gift and just to share it with anybody that showed an interest. That stayed with me as I went into primary school. And I think it was there I was introduced to my first, um, my first dance class. That I was signed up to and the teacher that I, I met and was introduced to at that time it was going to be a long-standing relationship because we worked together for six years for six years I stayed in his dance school and progressed through all of the levels and back in the 80s I think the main style of dance then well for now it's street dance isn't it a lot of the young people are into street dance but back then it was disco it was disco dancing that people were into and I was so into it um, I done a lot of competitions and a lot of performances and I did very well and I gained many many trophies and certificates along the years okay so from there um, when I got to about the age of 14 when I joined the Brit school um, my dance teacher also asked me if I wanted to be his assistant and so I was given my first opportunity at 14 years old of employment and I became a, an assistant dance teacher in my dance school and I really enjoyed back then being up front, um, demonstrating the moves and teaching young people my age. Some were even older and some were a lot younger but it done a lot for my social cohesion, it done a lot for my confidence it done so much for my character and it really taught me a lot and just built me up as a young girl that was newly into high school. Okay, so that journey, as I said, um, lasted for about six, six or seven years. I was the dance teacher there. But who knows, um, when you're on the journey to purpose, the enemy will try and step in. So my first experience, as I say, when I was about 14, my dance teacher, he used to drop me home on the Saturdays after I would teach the classes. And there was a particular day that came and he parked up in the usual spot and he dropped me home. But he became quite inappropriate with me is what I would say. 
he began to tell me how interested he was in me. I'd never known him this way before. As I said, I had been dancing with this gentleman since I was about six years old, and I'd progressed through all of the levels of his classes. And here I am at 14 years old, and he's dropped me home, and he begins to tell me that he's really fond of me and how much he likes me. And all of a sudden, this, this man's hand ends up on my thigh extremely inappropriate and tries to go to other places and I literally was so shocked I jumped out of the car I ran home and I didn't say a word to my parents to my friends or anyone because I didn't want him to come into any trouble or anything like that I didn't want to cause any problems for him and as I was thinking about this message today I looked back in reflection and it made me think about the young people coming up in the, this world in these days that suffer abuse, that suffer abuse, that encounter paedophiles, and that they'll keep their mouths shut and not to say anything. And I cast my mind back and I thought I did exactly the same thing a lot of our young people do. I kept that information to myself out of fear and because I didn't want him to come into any trouble, have to answer it, I didn't want to cause any, any strife, nothing, and I kept it to myself and I didn't say a word. And so I just want to speak to any of the young people here today. You must speak up and you must speak out. If you ever come into a situation inappropriate, similar to what I just described, it really is important to speak out. Say something to somebody, a friend, a parent, an aunt, an uncle. Always share these things and don't keep them back. Um, what I would say, although the enemy tried to deter me, he didn't succeed. I left that dance school, but I moved on to another. So I continued in my journey to purpose. Praise God. Okay, so as I said, I enrolled into the Brit School and I'd done GCSE dance and that just ignited my passion all the more. I became even more interested in dance and I wanted to pursue it all the way. So from there, um, when you leave high school, you make decisions about colleges, career paths and what it is that you want to study. So I said to myself, okay, I really am in love with the art of dance, but I also have a passion to sing and to act. And so for two years, um, I went and I studied performing arts just to see if I could you know, expand my creativity. Though it was a wonderful experience, it was a wonderful two years, I was not blessed with a voice to sing, and so I turned away from that. Um, the singing thing wasn't for me. And the acting was very good, but still the dance, the passion to dance really was the one. So from there, moving on to further education, I decided to enrol myself into Lewisham College, where I would study um, a BTEC National Diploma in dance for three years, for three years. Okay, so when I came into this environment, um, we learned about the anatomy of the body, how the muscles work, how to stretch, how to dance in a way that was safe and not to create or cause any injuries in the body, etc. And I felt as though I stepped into a whole new dimension. I never knew dance could be so interesting. Um, and I really was built up in that time, but who knows, the enemy tried to come back a second time whilst in that environment. So, as I say, it was a three-year course. Um, as I came to the end of the first course, first year, stepped into the second year, God began to speak to me at that point. And what he said to me, it was the first time I'd ever heard the voice of the Lord, and what he said to me was, yes, Anika, I have called you to dance, but it's unto my glory. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that looked like. All I know is that I wanted to dance in the music videos. Back in the 90s, some of you may remember the Mary J. Blige and the Jodeces of this world. That's what I was into, and I wanted to be a backing dancer. That's what I wanted to do. So here I am, at age 19, hearing the voice of the Lord saying, yes, I have called you to dance, but it's unto my glory. And I didn't know what that meant, and I didn't know what it looked like. 
And so I was a little bit confused, but one day I visited Ruach Ministries and I saw a dance ministry and I saw ladies ministering in dance and I said, oh my God, that's what you're talking about. And I actually got involved. I got involved and I became one of the um, dancers at Ruach Ministry and that really was my training grounds for prophetic dance. So, um, you know, another step towards my calling. Um, as I said, this started from the age of three or four, I'm now 19 and it's still stuck with me and I'm still feeding this, this call to dance. Okay, so I'm in the second year at Lewisham College and I begin to struggle because who knows that when you're studying and your course um, progresses, things intensify, things get harder, you become more challenged. So I'm in year two and I'm noticing that I'm struggling with anything that requires me to balance or anything that requires me to turn two, three, four times. I'm struggling and my teachers are also realizing there's a bit of a problem here, there's something not quite right. They're noticing that I'm struggling. And so what they advised was that I went to go and see the on-site physiotherapist at the time. And that was a lady called Zena. And this is when the enemy came at me again. So she gave me a full body um, skeletal examination just to look at how my limbs were lined up, etc., and for any weaknesses. So she, we come to the end of this examination and the lady sits me down. And um, she takes me totally off topic and says to me, so what are your other interests other than dancing? And I sort of said, well, I don't really have any other interests. You know, I just, I just want to dance. That's what I want to do. She said, There's, there must be something else that you're interested in. And I'm thinking, what on earth is this? So a few minutes later, as it opens up, she says, well, the examination shows that you have a weakness in your ankles that is actually too bad to correct, it cannot be corrected. And so, if you wanted to be a dancer, it would be a waste of your time, you would struggle, you wouldn't actually make it, and it wouldn't go anywhere. So you'd be best giving up now and pursuing um, a different direction. And she really tried to talk me out of um, my passion, my love and my desire for this art form that we call dance. And I remember in the moment thinking, how strange, this woman is a teacher, she's employed by the college, we come to her for help, for, for strengthening to correct any injuries or anything like this. And this woman is abusing her authority and telling me, I will not make it and that I need to choose a different career path. Back then, at age 19, um, I was young in Christ, I hadn't been raised um, in a Christian home. I didn't really have any mentors or anyone around me that I felt that I could go to for advice or just, you know, to pray for me or anything like that. I kind of felt quite alone, um, I remember, in that phase of my life. And so the sad thing is the enemy for a time, he succeeded because I took that news and I took it as though it was gospel. Um, I said to myself, okay, fine, well, she's the physiotherapist, she knows best. I am struggling, and so I guess this is not going to work out for me. I had nobody to pray into me, to build me up, and to point me back on the right track, to tell me that you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you, and that, yes, Anika, you have a calling on your life, and you can do this, and God will take you through. I had nobody, nobody at all, and so... As I say, my family were not in Christ, my mum wasn't in Christ, and I went home and I cried my eyes out. And my mum, trying to be the best mum that she could, she said, you know, Anika, it will be fine, I'll support you and we'll start looking for a job. You know, maybe you could be an assistant somewhere. Being, you know, that's where she was at the time, she had no spiritual advice for me at all. And so, just to add, this was three weeks before the end of year exams. And I literally dropped out. Three weeks to go. Three weeks to go. And I had nobody telling me, come on, you can do this. You know, stick with it, you'll be fine. And I literally stepped away so near, so near to finishing, right at the end, but I stepped away. Anyway, 
as I say, the enemy, it seemed, he had succeeded at that time. And so I got involved doing things that I was not called to do. I think I became an office assistant um, in a stationary company and then in an architect's company. And then I ended up working in banking. So everything that I found myself doing had no creative element to it whatsoever. And I was so miserable. I was absolutely miserable. And I remember that even if I'd go home and watch the TV, if anything creative came on the TV, um, if I saw any dancers or anything like that, I would change the channel, I'd look away, i just shut down my whole world of dance, i just shut it down, and i tried to turn my back and just walk away from it. I wouldn't even speak about it anymore. It was that hard. It, I was heartbroken, absolutely heartbroken. And so, what I would say at the same time is, Whilst going through that process, it's as though I forgot that God had spoken to me. God had already confirmed and spoken and said, Anika, I have called you to dance and it's unto my glory. It's almost as though I'd forgotten his word. You know, I, I didn't even recall that God had affirmed me and told me <laughs> I am called in this area. And there's me, I've gone off in a completely different direction. And as I was reflecting on this just last night, it came to my mind the thought of Eve in the garden. God gave them everything, Adam and Eve. They, they were given everything. They were able to eat of all the fruit and to partake of absolutely everything. But the one thing that God spoke to them was, do not eat of the tree of good and evil. Do not eat of this tree. That was his word. But somebody came and spoke into Eve and she gave ear and she listened. And because she listened and forgot about what God said, she stepped out of God's purpose for her. What happened next changed the whole course of her destiny and it changed the whole course of mankind today. And we still suffer, suffer and reap those consequences in life today. And that's what it kind of reminded me of. God affirmed me, he gave me his word and I forgot about it. And somebody else came along to whisper in my ear and I gave her my ear as though she was bigger than God. And I took her word and I ran with it. And God's word diminished in my life. So anyway, I came to a place where I was about 20 years old now. I had traveled with my family. We'd gone to New York for a wedding, family wedding in um, the USA. And who knows that if you belong to God, he won't just leave you by the wayside. He won't just leave you blown with the wind. He will come back for you. He will come back and claim you and set your feet back on the right path. So I'd gone all the way to New York. And um, my godmother, who lives out there, had invited me to a church service. Didn't know any of the people. She didn't know what was going on with me. And I thought, okay, we'll go. We'll go to church. We went to church. And the pastor called me out, young lady, come here. Thinking me, you know, I'm like 19 years old, I don't know anyone here, I'm coming for the first time, come here. And the pastor says to me, what do you do for a living? I said, um, I'm a bank cashier. And he said, no, you're not. I said, I am, I genuinely am, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bank teller. He said, no, there's something that you do. He said, God has just given me a vision of you and it's got nothing to do with you being a bank teller. That doesn't make any sense. What is it that you do for a living? I said, I'm, I'm a bank teller. I count money at the bank, that's what I do. And there was something deep down inside of me that wanted to speak up and say, I'm called to dance, but I just couldn't connect with it and I just couldn't bring it to leave my lips to set because I was disconnected, totally disconnected from the call. You know, I no longer was feeding that desire and I shut it down completely and some time had gone by and he persisted with me. God bless him, this man really persisted with me. And so finally I sort of sheepishly said, I dance, <laughs> while I closed, I dance. And he said, okay. He said, yes, that's right you do dance. He said, come here. He said, God has just given me a vision of you um, that your dance school is gonna be very successful. That He said, I see you climbing lots of stairs and each time you get to the top level, 
doors open and funds keep coming in and then you climb to the next level and the doors open and the funds keep coming in and it keeps on happening and you're going to be successful, you're going to progress. He said, and I need to anoint your feet is what the Holy Spirit had said. Here I am in the US of A <laughs> thinking, oh my God, you know, God has sent out a rescue party just for me. And so he asked me to remove my feet and the ministers and the pastors came and they anointed my feet and they prayed into me. And I really appreciated that and I felt so affirmed, you know, and I got the plane back. I came back to London still wondering, well, which way now, God? What do I do with this? You know, still a little bit confused and he gave me further direction. I went to um, a conference at the Brixton Academy and the speaker was Bishop Noel Jones and um, he spoke um, into my life that night and he said to me, the Lord said, you haven't finished your course at college, you didn't finish, you dropped out, God is sending you back, repeat the year, complete it. The enemy spoke into your life and tried to deter you from your destiny. But God said, go back, go back, finish your studies and complete your course. I could have fainted. I could have fainted. God came through for me. It wasn't over. It wasn't over. My dreams were still alive. God had still kept his promise and I was totally overwhelmed. During this time, I'd had my first child. She's now 17 years old, next month. I'd had my first child, and there were not any dancers on the course that had had a baby. And so I've gone in, and I've applied, and they've said, okay, well, you know, we'll audition you, but your body, you know, things would have changed, you won't be as strong as you were, and we're really not sure this is right for you anymore. We're not sure this is right for you anymore. We're not sure that, you know, you'll be able to take on the demands of family life as well as study and the physical implications of training as a dancer. And so I auditioned and I was successful and I, I was accepted. And what I did at that time was repeat the second year, but there was one year to go. I repeated the second year and I passed my exams with flying colours. To God be the glory. And so from there, I was considering doing year three. And God said, sent somebody else to speak to me. There was a gentleman that worked in the cafeteria upstairs, a Christian guy. And we used to chat every lunchtime and um, just converse about Christ and encourage one another. And he was very prophetic. And he spoke into my life and he said, God said that... Um, you're to audition for the London Contemporary Dance School, that you're not to finish the third year here, but go and audition to do degree level um, dance. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they're already looking at me funny, you know, the teachers here, they're not so welcoming, I've got a child, and they didn't think that I could um, repeat year two successfully, I'm thinking that there's so much going against me. And so I went to my teachers and I said, look, I'm gonna audition for the London Contemporary Dance School rather than staying here for the third year. And I was advised against it. Everyone said, no, you're not ready. You're not ready. You need to do level three here and then move on. And so I'm thinking, you know what, God, you, you're really speaking to me and you're really leading me down this path. I'm, I'm staying with this. I'm walking with you. I'm walking with you. I'm gonna go with this. And so, bearing in mind th this weakness in my ankles that is still a problem, but, you know, I'm getting through by the grace of God. So I've gone to London Contemporary Dance School. Once again, it's degree level studies. Nobody here has children. And um, I have a child. I've auditioned, been successful, told them about the issue with my ankles. And instead of it being a negative, they were really intrigued. They wanted to learn more about it. They showed me their apparatus, their Pilates studio, where you could go to strengthen the body, build yourself up, and the, um, the online physio there, it's really strange. She was just really intrigued by the condition of my feet and my ankles and wanting to know what I just wanted to work with me. And they designed a program for me. <laughs> they designed a program 
to support me, to strengthen my body whilst training. And so it was absolutely wonderful. So I attended the London Contemporary Dance School. Whilst I was there, um, I stepped out and I began teaching privately, private classes in the community. And I started to teach prophetic dance within the community and it was absolutely wonderful. So much so to the point where I became overwhelmed with bookings. I had schools ringing me left, right and centre. Can you come and teach in our school? Can you come and deliver this to our children, youth clubs, etc.? And it was absolutely wonderful. But who knows, the enemy stepped in again to, to distract me this time. So if you remember, God said to me, and you must, it's so important to hold on to the things that God says and do not deter from, do not adapt try and twist and try and fit it into what you're doing, which is what I did next, by the way. Um, so all the schools calling me and um, money was good, it was flowing. And so what happened was the, the call to sp uh, teach prophetic dance diminished. And I began functioning in the schools instead in the education system, teaching A-level dance, teaching B-tech dance, teaching dance after school, just any way I could teach dance. I would teach classical ballet, street dance, contemporary dance, um, jazz dance. I would teach. And this call to into the prophetic would just diminish diminish and diminish to the point where I would only introduce Christ into the schools at Easter and at Christmas. That's as far as the program would go with me. And all along I could hear the Holy Spirit whispering to me, saying, this is not how I called you. This is not how I called you. And I could hear the whisper all along. But I struggled. I struggled with having a certain level of success and trying to walk in my calling, I couldn't quite see how the two would marry together. I couldn't, in my mind's eye, I couldn't see how to make this work. And so I was operating in deception and it just was a big problem for me. And so I just turned a blind eye to it and I just continued with what I was doing. And I'd done this for 10 to 12 years. 10 to 12 years I did this and I just, you know, I would get the odd invitation to go and dance and minister in a church or in a conference and if I felt like it, I would go. If I wasn't feeling great, I wouldn't do it. And so I began to abuse the gift that God gave me thinking that I was in control of this and I'll use it when I want to. If I don't want to use it, I won't use it. Thinking that I was God over this gift and that I was in control. So what happened was I began to have quite major issues in, in my private life. I won't go into that today, that's for another time. And um, what God will do sometimes, back you up against a wall. <laughs> and so uh, whilst I was having these major issues in my private life, the business began to suffer and it slowly began to spiral downwards until God said to me, shut it down shut it down and I thought wow but I was in such a place of rock bottomness that I said okay I'm going to trust you God and I shut it down once I did that for the following two years God was able to speak to me and I was able to hear clearly about how he had called me and what I was supposed to be doing he took me on a two-year process a two-year journey in that time i crossed paths with Pro prophetess jacqueline annie and um, i signed up on her lmpp program and she really prayed into me and really encouraged me and um if you know anything about the program it's very prophetic and it is to do with your calling and your purpose and god began to speak to me even more and he gave me the blueprint for quite a few businesses actually. I think I'm on number 21 <laughs> at the moment. But in terms of um, which order I'm to birth these in, looking at the first and second, he gave me a blueprint for um, the Aralia School of Prophetic Dance, which I launched in February, just gone. 
where I teach young people and women um, to dance prophetically and um, the various things that come under that. Um, and it's been absolutely amazing. Um, also, he gave me the blueprint for a performing arts school um, for Christian children to build them up in their singing, their dancing and their acting so that they can use their talents for his glory. Because how many of you know a lot of our kids, they're very creative, they like to sing, they like to dance, they like to act, they like to express themselves. But, you know, we put them in front of the TV and they're looking at Drake, they're looking at Rihanna, they're looking at all of these people and they're being influenced. But really, uh, God is calling me to raise up the young people in the kingdom to use their talents unto his glory. And so, so much has come to light in my journey. And so I now I see where the performing arts came in um, because I did study that for two years. And although it's been rough and the enemy has to try to take me out quite a few times, I've stayed focused. I wasn't always obedient. I wasn't always obedient. But even in your disobedience, just know that God hasn't left you. He hasn't left you. His hand is still on you. He's placed a juris jurisdiction around you. You can go so far and no further. If you belong to him, he will reel you back in. He will reel you back in. And so it doesn't matter the obstacles that you face on your journey to purpose. It doesn't matter if you fall into disobedience, if you fall into sin. It's so important just to repent and come back to that place. Come back into his presence and allow him just to pour out into you. Because in him is everything. In him is your destiny. In him is your purpose. There is nothing outside of God. Don't even entertain it. There is nothing outside of him. Nothing. Not a thing. Everything is inside of him. And there are some of us here today, there is purpose inside of you. There is destiny inside of you. God has placed a call inside of you. And he wants you to birth that. He wants you to fulfill it whilst you're still living, whilst you're here in the earth, whilst you have life. Now is the time to fulfill the purpose, your calling, your mandate. Now is the time. Now is the time. Everyone should be doing something towards your purpose. Doesn't matter even if you're at the beginning stages, just making notes, making notes, making a, a business plan, whatever it is, you should be doing something actively, actively bringing it to fruition. That I think, you know, for all of us here today, don't let judgment day come, that day when God says, why didn't you? Why didn't you? Nobody wants to hear those words. Why didn't you? We're here today, we are alive, we have health, we have strength in our bodies, glory to God. And while we are here, we need to pursue the things of God. We need to seek his face. We need to find out, God, what was I born into this earth for? What is the purposes in my life? What is the mandate? What is my calling? And we need to take steps every day towards fulfilling that. Because one of the things that we overlook sometimes is that your purpose is not necessarily about you. It's about somebody else. It's about the next person. Yeah? Your purpose is somebody else's answer. Your purpose is somebody else's deliverance. Your purpose, your journey, your testimony is about somebody else being set free. And so what I'd say to you today is let's stop being selfish. Let's stop being selfish. It's not even about us. It's not even about us. It is not about us. Take your eyes off of yourself. Take your eyes off of yourself. And just know that in your obedience, there's a nation that's going to be delivered. In your obedience, there's a nation that's going to be set free. In your obedience, there's a nation that's going to answer the call upon their life. And so I encourage you today just to look to God to go before the throne of the King of Kings and just to seek his face about your purpose. He's already written it in your heart. It's not something that you're totally disconnected with and have no clue about. It's already written in your heart. For some of you, it's burning inside of you right now under the sound of my voice. It's already written in your heart. 
and it is your responsibility as a kingdom citizen to fulfill the call upon your life. Don't play with it. You're not here just to live life and just to have fun and to socialize, to go to work, make money, and to purchase the things that you want that make you feel good. That's an empty life. That's an empty life. Kingdom living has a higher call. And it's all about the kingdom. We have shifted. We have shifted. We are in a new realm. We are living in a new dimension today. It's about kingdom living. You must seek God for your kingdom purpose. And you must achieve it in the time that you have. We don't know how long we're going to be here. None of us know. Only he knows the day, the hour, and the second that he'll snatch you out of this life. And if you haven't fulfilled the call upon your life, my God, I hate to think about what's next. But whilst you're here and you are living, honour God, live in obedience, and see that you come into the fullness of the call upon your life. God bless you all. Thank you.